Our nostalgic journey has taken us to Burbank, California to visit with a man whose uh, career was very important to the good old days of radio, as we love to call them, and uh, whose name was very well known uh, many's the time uh, we heard. The, and now here's Charles Lyons for, and then a product was mentioned, or here's Charlie Lyon for, and so we say here's Charlie Lyon, and we're glad to be here. Well, it's nice of you to stop by, Chuck. Glad to see you. And your wife. Thank you. <laughs> your career um, blossomed quite a bit in the Chicago uh, segment of it, didn't it? It certainly did. They were very, very good to me there and uh, very understanding and forgiving. <laughs> <laughs> forgiving? <laughs> what did we have to, what, why did Chicago have to be forgiving? Well, uh, I hadn't been in radio too long. Mm -hmm. I was at, originally in WTAM in Cleveland, and uh, NBC bought the station a couple of months after I went there, and John Royal, who was the general manager, went into NBC New York as the vice president in charge of programs, and about two months after that, I was transferred to, uh, to Chicago NBC. So I had actually only been in radio about six months before I oh, was. Oh, so sent Chicago over. was basically the beginning of it then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And were you on the on the staff, the NBC? I was staff? on staff uh -huh. and sent over uh, primarily to do special events mm -hmm. for uh, NBC, the Central Division. And I uh, was on staff, however, and carried a regular staff schedule. What would that have been? Now, about when was this? Uh, that was in. Uh, April. <laughs> this is about when they were recording Time and Stone. Uh, 1931. Mm -hmm. I went over there. And then you were, what were the duties of a staff announcer well, you, at that uh, time? I think the, the, the prime requisite was that you be uh, able to play a xylophone. Because <laughs> in those days you rang chimes after every show, and you did it manually, and not just the three chimes that you currently hear, but you did bing, 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 and you had to keep from hitting in between them. <laughs> the whole thing, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Was that, sure. a, was that a, ti uh, a time signal? No, the no, end? That no, was the total no, no. NBC identification? Yeah, that was for the, uh, you'd say... Uh, this is the Blue Network of the National Broadcasting Company, and mm -hmm. then do your little solo, and then the stations would cut away and uh, do their stuff with the bullets and so forth. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> were you were you network staff or the local staff? Network. Network. So you and we had two networks then, mm -hmm. the red and blue. That was before they divided them, and the blue finally became ABC. Mm. Well, you were working in for uh, both segments of the mm -hmm. NBC then? We had two stations, mm -hmm. WMAQ and WENR. Mm -hmm. Didn't WENR share its frequency with WLS? Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh -huh. And you were heard on both of those, not LS though, on MAQ no. and ENR. Mm -hmm. What some of the shows that you were involved with in those days? Oh, good night. You work with Jim and Marion Jordan? Yeah, and mm -hmm. Smack Out. Mm -hmm. I see Jim very often. And uh, incidentally, he just looks great. He certainly oh, does, doesn't gosh. he? <laughs> He's feeling better than ever. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Smack out, and uh, oh, I did a soap opera called uh, Girl Alone. <laughs> that was a heart gripping thing. <laughs> and uh, oh, gosh, I, I've even forgotten the name of the one that I did for General Mills, and the principal reason that I moved out here or a contributing reason. And I did the so-called Sinclair Wiener Minstrels. That was on the Blue Network. That was Wiener Minstrels. Yeah, W-E-N-R, because -E uh -huh. that's where it started. Mm -hmm. and, uh, now, you were m announcing. You were not uh, yeah. uh, uh, otherwise performing on that's these right. shows. That's mm right. -hmm. But didn't you, as an announcer, participate a little bit more than just uh, with the announcing duties in some of those yes, shows? Yes, I did a lot of the... Uh, special events. Uh, I believe it was in uh, the first year I was there that uh, Wiley Post and Harold Gatty
flew around the world mm -hmm. in a little uh, uh, Lockheed, what kind of a plane? Orion, I believe it was, Lockheed Orion or something uh -huh. called uh -huh. Winnie Mae. And NBC sent me up to uh, Edmonton, Alberta. It was the first program on NBC where the engineers and the announcer were NBC personnel. They were not taking it from CBC. Oh, I it see. Was Canadian. It not was from an Canada. NBC uh -huh. origination. Mm -hmm. And so I went up to meet them, and I made two more flights up there. And I did the... Uh, then in 1932, uh, the political conventions, both were held in Chicago. And on the first one, Graham McNamee came out from New York and was the uh, announcer in charge, and I worked on the floor around among the delegates mm -hmm. and so forth. Did you have to have, we see on television today when all the, <clears throat> the, the floor reporters are on, they've got the headsets and the, the backpack and all the other things like that. How did, how did you work it in those days? I think we just, as I recall, we just had a microphone and a long line. One long line. Yeah. We didn't have any uh, <laughs> long cord. <laughs> sure. Well, <clears throat> then uh, Graham, when the Democratic Convention came along, uh, Graham wasn't well. And so, by gosh, I drew the assignment and was the, uh, the anchor chief man, announcer, or less. yeah, uh -huh. for the, uh, and that was when FDR was nominated. That was a pretty exciting convention. I can't imagine it was, yeah. One of the most exciting things I ever saw, perhaps exciting isn't the word, but nerviest, cer certainly. Are you speaking as a, just an observer of the convention or as a, as a, uh, a radio Reporter. Uh, I, I was just a reporter. I, I, at that time, you could not express any opinion. You could just uh, say what you saw mm -hmm. right then. And we had political commentators to uh, cover the political implications. On the floor of the convention, though, were you were you trying to get comments from this person and that person as much as they do today? I mean, oh, was yes. it the same kind of a thing? Yeah. You say, here we are at the. Illinois delegation, mm -hmm. and we want to talk with them. Sure. Uh -huh. Oh yes, but the uh, that Democratic convention at that particular time, when uh, Roosevelt was about to be nominated, uh, there was a big conflict between Jimmy Walker, the mayor of New York, and FDR, and a committee had been established to investigate. James J. Walker, mm -hmm. and the committee had just reported to the governor of New York, FDR, and given their report, and it was not a very flattering report. As a matter of fact, it was practically an indictment. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy Walker was staying out on Lakeshore Drive with Vincent Bendix. And after the second ballot was taken, it was around 12.30, he assumed that there would be no third ballot taken that night, so he went home, went back to ben Bendix home. However, they decided to go on and have another ballot. So about 3 o'clock in the morning, the New York delegation voted, and uh, Jimmy Walker's alternate represented him, and Jimmy Walker did not like FDR. So the alternate voted for Alfred E. Smith. And about 10 minutes later, the door on the Madison Avenue street side busted open, and in came Jimmy Walker in his pajamas and a, a top coat over him and came walking right down the center aisle and Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and the chairman that I recognize, the delegate from New York, James A. Walker said, I understand my alternate has voted for me. Uh, if it pleases the chair, I'd like to have his vote withdrawn, and I will cast my own. And so they finally decided they could do that, and said, how does the delegate from New York vote? And he said, James J. Walker, mayor of the city of New York, and a delegate from that city 
cast one vote for Alfred E. Smith <laughs> and turned around and went out on the back of it. <laughs> but it was a, quite a nervy thing. Oh, an exciting it time, was, too. He was throwing it right into the teeth of FDR. <laughs> well, he was quite a showman, and of he course sure he was. was also aware, I'm sure, of the uh, the radio coverage. Oh, yeah. uh, there had been earlier coverage of conventions, I think, oh, on yes. radio, but this at this point in '32 had 32. to be up to that point the largest listening audience uh, oh, yes. ever at that time. Yeah. yeah, oh, it grew every mm -hmm. four years, so it, it was very important. You were involved in some other special event activities for NBC, too, in those days, and shortly thereafter. You were in Chicago till the middle 40s then, weren't you? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. 46, mm -hmm. we moved out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did the, uh, oh, good night, the Century of Progress. We dedicated every building and every room in them <laughs> <laughs> that was built down on the lake shore. Didn't NBC... We must explain, we're in your living room and we have an audience outside of the oh house here, right? Sakes. Oh, yeah. Got a couple of dogs? That's a <laughs> nutty little dog that walked in here on his own on three legs. He'd been hit by a car, uh -huh. so we got him fixed up and he's still living here and yelling. Would you like for me to go out and hush him up? No, no, no. That's all right. It's all right. It's it's the net. But we know one is a nice little basset hound. Is that yeah. the one? Is that no, the one? no. That's the other little fellow, Herbie. Uh -huh. Herbie? And the little black dog. And the basset hound's name is not Sam. Cleo. Oh, Sam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sam and Herbie. It sounded like a vaudeville. <laughs> <laughs> the Sam and Henry. That was uh, that was before you got to Chicago, I think. Well, not much before. <laughs> well, you're talking about the Century of Progress. Didn't NBC have a studio site there? Oh the, yes. And you worked yes. out of that. Matter of fact, I think CBS did mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh yes, we we did lots of shows there. And what kind of shows uh, did originate, aside from the openings of each of the exhibits? Well, I remember uh, one in particular, Admiral Byrd, was on the air for uh, General Foods. And he came out, oh, no, no, pardon me, oh, that's an awful faux pas, because the principal sponsor of his uh, trip to Antarctica was uh, Horlick's Malted Milk. And he came mm -hmm. out there because Horlicks was right up in Racine, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we did the show there. Harry Von Zell came out to do the announcing there. I think all I said was this is NBC or something <laughs> like that. But it was quite a thrill to meet him. Von Zell actually was the announcer for the Bird Expedition. He did uh, all the bridging mm -hmm. when Bird was on the expedition. Yeah. He, he came mm -hmm. out to handle mm -hmm. the, the Admiral. Oh, gosh, let's see. What else? Well, there must have been so much going on uh, at at the fair that uh, the world was really getting pretty good coverage from radio. Weren't oh, they? yes. And you were helping along. <laughs> <laughs> very good coverage. And it was it was very well handled. They, uh, uh, General Dawes was cognizant <laughs> of the importance yeah. of it and saw to it that it was well handled. Before the uh, before the war broke out, Chicago was really a pretty important center for network radio. For a while, I believe we were originating. Uh, it was either 68 or 72. Now, why those two figures uh -huh. stand out, I don't know. Uh, 68 or 72 percent of all the programs on NBC coming right out of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Now, those were principally uh, soap operas, every 15 minutes, by gosh. <laughs> and were you were you there with the chimes and the, yeah. uh, the ID and the whole business? Sure. Huh? Oh, my. And <laughs> one of the more exciting adventures and <laughs> kind of humorous was in those days you could, um, a sponsor could buy the Southeast Network, or the southwest leg, or the middle states, or the mm -hmm. northeast, northwest. So good night. Sometimes it was necessary to have three or four announcers, and all doing, they all weren't uh, selling the same product. Uh, for example, uh, maybe in the southwest they were giving away sombreros with a box of something, mm -hmm. and they weren't doing it in other parts of the country, so it would have to be a special announcer. Well, they came, I was doing a musical show one morning, 
And in came Bill Kephart, who was the supervisor of announcers, and said, for gosh sakes, get into uh, Studio E. You're on draft or something like that. <laughs> and I remember it was the show started out with Dr. Brent calls surgery. <laughs> so I ran in there, and all I had the script was the script. And I looked, and there were four, the announcer and four characters, supposed to be four actors, and they weren't there. <laughs> and a sound man, he was, no, he wasn't there either. So good night. I started out, the, and Dr. Brent called surgery was supposed to be the, <laughs> the phone operator paging the hospital uh -huh. for good old Dr. Brent. <laughs> and so I had to be the nurse, or the phone operator, too. So, Dr. Brent called surgery. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, dress presents and all. Oh, gosh, it was a wild thing. And I got all through, and... Uh, we called the advertising agency in New York immediately and said, what the dickens? No one knew <laughs> this was going to happen. They said, well, we sent a girl out there to uh, to get the cast all ready, and my gosh, she picked a man for it. What's the idea of that woman? <laughs> <laughs> they had heard you do it. Yeah, huh? I had to do it. And they had discovered that it was a man. I didn't do a very good impersonation. <laughs> Well, you were talking. You mentioned about the fact that there would be uh, different commercials for different segments of the mm -hmm. full network. Would that be different commercials for the same product? Generally, yes. Generally, yeah. So well, I guess it uh, always was. Uh huh. Was it a possibility then that uh, while the program was being broadcast live, there might be four? Suppose there were four different mm -hmm. sec sections to this. There would be four live announcers and. Four different studios, yeah. I assume. Yeah. Each coming in at the same time and meeting the cues yeah. and all of that. All time. That must have been really interesting. <laughs> I've never heard that story before. It was That's wild. quite something. It was wild. They generally had a little music at the end, so there'd be a little pad, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and your announcer or your engineer could fade it in rather than just uh -huh. bust it. In. Give a little uh, a little yeah. softening to it. Mm -hmm. Were you working on any of the nighttime broadcast in your Chicago days? Oh, uh, well, that minstrel show thing was. Oh, yes, and I did uh, a thing for Real Silk, Charles Previn, and uh, Countess Olga Albani, <laughs> singer. <laughs> and, oh, gosh, I had George Gershwin, and uh, he was just one appearance, a star appearance. But we had stars coming in from mm -hmm. New York every week. That was for real silk. Where boss did you live when you were in Chicago in those days? I lived at 1366 North Dearborn. 1366 Dearborn. Yeah, huh? my. Right across from the racket club. Oh, yes. Oh, it's nice yeah. and easy to get to the merchandise mark from there, I think. Huh? I had the <laughs> greatest deal going you ever heard of. Uh, in the wintertime, or if it was raining, it was hard to get a cab. But not far from uh, that address was a place called the Union Livery. And my golly, they had Cadillac limousines and chauffeurs. Mm -hmm. and, and so every morning, I'd leave the apartment at 9.30, go down, and there was the limousine, and just a dollar. <laughs> a dollar. <laughs> a dollar. <laughs> and then they'd pick me up after. I didn't even own a car in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Well, it was not bad uh, transportation. A oh, God, whole limousine no. at your disposal for a dollar a trip. That's, uh, that's going in class. Always huh? right there and <laughs> no worry about snow or rain or anything else. Is that why you left Chicago, because of the snow and the rain? No. Uh -huh. No, uh, I left it because at that time uh, radio seemed to be on the decline, that is so far as uh, network origination. In Chicago? Commercially, yeah. Uh -huh. And it all seemed to be moving out here to California. And I had an offer from uh, um, Hedda Hopper to come out here. And uh, General Mills was moving out here, so I had that show and uh, Hedda Hopper. Now, how, how, how would Charles Lyons, a staff announcer at NBC in Chicago, get an offer from Hedda Hopper? Now, I know you're very well mm -hmm. known, but how, well how would that come about? Well, I wasn't well enough known for that, I'll tell you. Uh, our very best friends 
or Lama Abner, mm -hmm. and they moved out here in 1938. And every spring, my wife would come out here about two weeks ahead of me, and then I would come out to spend two or three weeks. <laughs> we practically lived here then. And uh, I would go down to NBC with, uh, with Tuffy Golf. We stayed at Abner's house. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd go down, I'd go down with them to do their show. And a perfectly remarkable businesswoman named Dima Harshbarger had been uh, in Chicago, and I did a number of shows for her. She had a company called, oh dear, what was it? Some Concert Artists. Mm -hmm. She uh, booked all these concert artists, and then finally NBC bought that from her, and she came out here, <coughs> pardon me, to run the artist service here. <coughs> Pardon me, <coughs> I'm talking too much. <laughs> uh, and Dima also was the one who uh, was the guiding angel behind uh, Hedda Hopper. So uh, P&G was going to put Hedda Hopper on, and uh, I was lucky enough that <laughs> Dima knew me it, and uh -huh. steered me into it. And so. then, then you went into uh, many other uh, important shows, actually. Did lots of them. Mm -hmm. Let's refresh our memory. Some of the shows well, you did. Well, <laughs> Roy Rogers, good night. Uh, Gene Autry. Uh, you did all the commercials for Wrigley's Spirit yeah, Gum, all didn't of those. you? Yeah, all of those, For Gene Autry and the Melody Ranch. Didn't they consider that a conflict of interest for you to work for both Gene Autry and Roy Rogers? Well, they, they weren't on at the same time. Um, oh, you mean not... Roy was on for <coughs> Alka-Seltzer, mm -hmm. and Gene was on for Wrigley. And that I believe by the time I started doing Gene's show, uh, Roy's show had gone off the air. Oh, I see. Roy, by the way, is making a terrific splash now. That's right, he Currently is. Currently, he's yeah. making some new pictures. And Got a nice uh, museum out uh, in the... Southern California here someplace. Yeah, out, out near uh, Victorville, Apple uh -huh, Valley. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <coughs> well, you but, worked uh, with um, uh, the Lassie show. And Lassie had a show on the radio, yes. too. Oh, Heaven's Oh, that was something. Sure, good old Lassie. Did they bring Lassie into the studio, or mm -hmm. was Mr. Sound Effects Man uh, no. the one? No, we had a, not only had Lassie, but we had an animal imitator in the event Lassie's <laughs> became disinterested. Oh, he had a standby, <laughs> huh? He had but a. Lassie uh, never missed. He didn't. No, never did. Well, how would how would you get the Lassie <coughs> to? Uh, well, I suppose just on cue from the trainer. Yeah, uh -huh. Lassie stood right on the table, and uh, uh, Rudd Weatherwax, who owns Lassie, mm -hmm. uh, stood right there, and he had the leash, and he'd get his attention and give him the finger signal, and old Lassie would bark like mad, and <laughs> growl, and all that stuff. Did Lassie ever do it uh, not on cue? Did he ever bark? No. No, no he perfectly trained. Wonderful dog. <laughs> oh, he was a smart dog. Gosh, yes. <laughs> You you made a, a nice easy transition from radio to television too. I was very lucky there too, mm -hmm. by George. I've never had an agent. Done it all on your uh, well, on your talent. Uh, no, <laughs> golly, and that that's pretty thin. That's well, talent. I wouldn't agree but, with you. Uh, I was doing a, a show for I was doing two shows for Carlton E. Morse. One was called. Uh, Oh, what the dickens was that? Something about a ghost, Mercedes McCain. Oh, it was uh, I Love a Mystery, huh? No. No, th this was another one. Uh, that mystery preceded this one. Well, anyway, it was Mercedes mm -hmm. McCambridge. It was just the world's longest chase. It <laughs> never did get any place. Uh -huh. It went every place, uh -huh. but never did catch anybody. But uh, I was also doing one called the woman in my house for Carlton. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> California is really a very healthful uh. spot to live in. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, Ed Bailey 
was who I first met when he was a page boy in NBC Chicago, uh, was producing Truth or Consequences. <clears throat> and they first had this was the nighttime show for Old Gold, and they hired me as a writer. And you really, that's a, a very deceptive title because you certainly don't write much on For truth or consequences, yeah. No, it's a matter of thinking up situations mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. gags and so forth. So I did that and also announced the nighttime show. Then that went off. But the last show, uh, we were going to a special event in... Uh, uh, Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Some druggist down there had been washed out in a flood and he was <coughs> going to retire and get out of the business because he had financial difficulties or something. So anyhow, we went down there and got him out of town and rebuilt his whole doggone store and all that. And that was the last show of the nighttime TRC. Mm -hmm. And a few months later, Two months later, Ralph Edwards called me up and said they were going on NBC every day. And would I be interested in announcing it and being associate producer? So, doggone right. <laughs> mm -hmm. so I went down and started and ran for about 20 years. Yeah. Is it? Are you still involved with this at this no. point? No. Uh, TRC, last year... In June, by that time we were two years ahead in our uh, tapings. Two years yeah. ahead? Uh, well, now I should clarify that a little bit. Um, there were only, I believe, ten stations that were carrying the current product uh -huh. that we would make them and ship them right out. Mm -hmm. The others were at least a year behind because it's a syndicated mm -hmm. program mm -hmm. and whenever you buy it you can start at whatever point mm -hmm. you want. So uh, uh, then some of the other stations were two years behind and gee whiz it got to a point where we were so far ahead that it was not a great deal of advantage to continuing that way because mm -hmm. you just get farther and farther and farther ahead. So I decided to uh, to just stop making them and uh, wait till everything caught up. Well, I, I don't know that I don't know whether they're going to start again or not. Mm -hmm. Well, they're I've still been, being shown all across the country. Yeah, but th mm -hmm. those are uh, are rerun a year, shows. Or, all reruns. Uh -huh, yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah. Golly, we were just down in New Orleans a couple of weeks ago, and I saw a show on down there that we'd made about three years ago. <laughs> and Miami was about the same thing. Well, you've had a very interesting career uh, in radio and in television. Uh, if you had a chance to do it all over again, would you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. sure. It's been very pleasant, and I've met very, very nice people who have become very, very good friends. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, That's uh, hard to come by. Yeah. You're a nice man yourself, and I well, appreciate your inviting you. us down to um, share some memories with you. Well, gee whiz. Love it. <laughs> thank you very much, Charles Lyons. Well, thank you very much for coming by, Chuck. I appreciate it.